Okay, I like to thank for this opportunity to give this presentation to you today. Uh, my name is Richard Bellaby uh, from the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. And I also recognize my positions at East China Normal University in Shanghai and at UCI University Kuala Lumpur. And further to thank the contributions of co-authors, Phil Wallhead, Hal Vodanovic, Greta Vogeldru, Jesse Lee, and Trong Christiansen. Today, I'm going to talk about an approach to develop and deliver relevant ocean acidification research for science and society, giving examples of Norwegian fjords. The background for this work is to make headway into delivering science which is relevant at the scales of coastal change, but also targeted to specific uh, coastal services such as aquaculture or kelp farming or fish nurseries. But also this knowledge is delivered through a co-produced uh, approach where stakeholders or users of the coast and service providers have been part of the process from the very beginning. Many of them were actually part of the proposal writing stage. Uh, many others have given advice on where to sample. Some of them have even been with, with us to sample. And we have held many meetings where we've discussed our scientific approach, explained the science, explained some of the consequences and targeted products such as the, so the science within three years of the project uh, timeline actually delivered uh, uh, um, change um, from local managers on coastal use and coastal management. But first I'll start with some background of why we have had to take this approach. And the first one is based on a quite a common usage of or identifying where scientists and where policymakers, where regional, local, national managers can get their data from. And very often it's from reading the IP, IPCC report and, and associated papers and getting a pH level or a PCO2 level for their experiment on their organism or their mesocosm. And they would just take a value from this. We want to, we want to look at pH in our region in 2100. So I'm going to take a pH of 7.75 and 8.01. One, and those will represent the habitat or the, the, chemist, the carbonate chemistry in our system at the end of the century. And that could still be taken, you could still go into the IPCC report the last summary for poly, policymakers and feel quite confident because of the agreement amongst the AR6 uh, models that they are five models that um, this is um, quite a, a safe bet and, and even more when you go to look to the BOP paper yes you can see that it's not necessarily a global average but even the regional values agree well between the models. If we go further I do have to admit this is unpublished work as yet soon to be submitted um, Yes, in the open ocean and uh, away from coastal or local, uh, not say anomalies, but features, you do get reasonably good agreement. But at the coastal scale, or that sometimes where major services are, are provided, there is a large disagreement between the observed pH values and the pH from an earth system model. 
but then again, their system models are not designed to deliver this information at local scale. So this is not a critique of a, a, an ESM, it's just a critique of the way that it has been used, or it is being used, the information that's coming from these, to guide uh, coastal management and also experiments on organisms. Um, and through the Sea to Coast project, which I will advertise later, uh, Niebuhr or Phil um, has now in a capacity now to deliver climate change information down to 800 meters for Norwegian, Western Norwegian coastal waters. And it's here that you can see on the left we have pH, uh, sorry, on the top we have pH uh, December, February. Uh, climatology for 20, 2005 to 2014 and then the summertime for the same uh, on the top right and below um, aragonite saturation state. The numbers are not particularly important for my point. What is very important is that in order to deliver management, if you want to place a, an aquaculture unit somewhere or you want to look at the um, mid-term 2030, 2050 um, uh, resilience or change um, under ocean acidification and climate change, then we need to really focus down to much finer scales than has previously been our capacity. And this change, this local change, is because of this very tight coupling between land and ocean and seabed and ocean, and also advection, connect, strong connectivity with other regions. And we have the traditional carbon, uh, carbonate system with ocean acidification represented because of CO2 exchange of the atmosphere. But we have to take into account very often input from rivers, uh, exchange with the seabed. We've got increasing methane contributions in the north and, and locally. Um, when we're looking at very northern Norway and the Barents Sea, we have strong processes such as uh, sea ice change and sea ice decline. So overall, it's not surprising that you get this local details. But how does one go ahead and uh, investigate at these local levels? As a scientist that lives in Norway, uh, sorry, lives in Bergen, or mostly, mostly out of the country, but um, how do we get closer to understanding local conditions? And this is where the first advantage of stakeholder participation comes in. <clears throat> now, traditionally, and I would say up to five years ago, I was guilty of this as well, that we would come together as a group of scientists and we would write a proposal. And we may, first of all, we'd go and look at our stressor database or our driver database, and we'd go and make some measurements. We might do some experiments, we'd do some models, we may do some experiments on ecosystem response. We do some projections with models, and then we would send the information out to stakeholders, assuming that they would understand the scientific complexity, uh, understand what a particular number may be. And it wasn't particularly efficient. We would get, <clears throat> we would get scientific papers, and that would lead, hopefully, to more project, uh, proposals being funded. What we have found is that to involve stakeholders from the beginning, to agree on ecosystem services. Through this process, our observations are more focused. Our experiments are more guided. The evaluation of the ecosystem response and the projections is done in tandem or in uh, party to input 
with stakeholders. And also you get something called translation. You get translation between the disciplines, uh, translation between the policy makers or the fishermen so that we, we come to develop a, a common currency of knowledge so that when we do deliver those scenarios, when we do deliver those facts or these um, projections, they are understood, they are no longer new numbers. And through that, it is much easier for them to develop or understand management and policy uh, applications. <clears throat> so just in one particular fjord that we studied uh, in Lofoten, um, gives an example of the, of the complexity, both of the services. So a major cod nursery ground, the largest salmon aquaculture unit in Norway, seaweed harvesting, and also the users, so the seafood restaurants, etc., and also get an understanding of very local but very important drivers of ocean acidification in this fjord is the hospital waste and the abattoir runoff and the agriculture nutrients and the use of the wetlands. So we have this very common discussion about where, where we can sample. go a bit further in, in what they what we can do is that yes they've helped us in we start anywhere here but we start at the top here we define the service we agree on the stresses they have a lot of background knowledge about how to uh, about change in their system where where, could, where organisms used to be found we find an old fisherman um, who's been work, use, using the ocean there for 70 years, he can tell you a lot about change. He can tell you a lot about how uh, things have shifted. We've also had community sampling. So the fisheries high school students were taking uh, water, uh, seawater samples for us and poisoning and sending them back to Bergen, which means that we can get a much better annual, uh, sm sh sm uh, shorter scale understanding of variability. And I think I've talked about the others, but you can see how stakeholders have been involved in every stage of our work. And an example of that is the first st stakeholder meetings where we had fishermen, the tourist industry, students and teachers and invited residents, just anybody who, who was interested, uh, discussions with tourists about use and why they were there, what was beautiful about the place. And, but all the way up to local and regional government and NGOs. One of the things about gaining the confidence of uh, of um, uh, of the locals is that one you can have a much more focused sampling. Uh, campaign. This is not the usual scientific sampling grid, which would have been every kilometer or whatever, or every uh, point zero one of a, uh, a degree, but it's informed. And also the fact that we, when we gain the confidence, we can take samples closer to industrial units than is legally allowed we got permission to go very close to the aquaculture units, um, which is a, is a great uh, advantage of this discussion. But what does this provide? Um, I'm, gonna, I only, I'm only gonna use uh, one example in this presentation, but this is the fjord where I showed this, the unusual sampling program. Um, yeah, one of the challenges, and we've discussed this in a workshop two weeks ago on the Sea to Coast project and it's ongoing, is yes, we, even if we can develop more informed uh, ocean acidification projections, how is this transferred to, uh, to knowledge? And it requires thresholds and there are very, very few thresholds 
out there and we were very open about this um, with them but um, the one that we used in our work was um, the work of, of Nina in 2019 because at, at that time it was one of the one of the first uh, threshold data of, of 0.9 to 1.5, depending on which physiological process and which response was given. I've added two new ones, which we did not discuss um, with, uh, with, with the stakeholders. This came after our project had finished. Um, and one also has to take into account with this presentation that the echinoderm work in 2021 is specifically on American systems and not based on too many on um, on urchin responses in our region. This is still much required work. And there is one actually done on, on local European lobsters, which says that uh, certain life stages have a sensitivity which really kicks in and has a very serious uh, or a very clear response at pHs, but just gives you an idea of the sort of information that we can all already see that um, seasonally uh, the fjord becomes, uh, get the fjord even through observations um, has a aragonite saturation, which is close to or below a response threshold um, of the pteropod, um, but also for green sea urchins, which are a very strong control of kelp uh, success and, and then obviously kelp harvesting potential with 2030, for example, or around 2025 to 2035, there <clears throat> could become challenges on uh, sea urchin populations. But again, this is not hard science to defer these numbers. <clears throat> but one thing that we did do, independent of the confidence in these thresholds, was to discuss with government departments and local regulators and fishermen and other users of these pressing challenges. And we, they, they were, happy to take the uncertainty in the biological thresholds and just the fact that the system was changing so quickly and uh, that they, they, they were made, they understood that action um, had to be taken locally. So already they have agreed to take a accumulated organic discharge from land so the gray water now which was taken which was released from the from the town from the large town is is now going to be taken out to the end of the fjord so that will help the inner fjord acidification over time and there are discussions about managing the effluent of the abattoir and controlling or um, the waste from the hospital for example and also onto wetland and agriculture management, because I say that it's a very coupled land ocean system. A lot of the ocean acidification features or the low pH features that we saw in the fjord are very likely tied to land use <coughs> and lack of or um, <coughs> management. At a, at a national scale, the Norwegian government agreed that the Water Framework Directive coordinators um, should really take into account ocean acidification because this is presently not part of um, coastal management decision making to a, de to a, to a, a great degree in Norway. So already our, um, our science had uh, to take. So anyway, this approach has been <clears throat> taken to the European level. I'm luckily enough to lead a proposal sea to coast. So you can look at sea to coast.com. Eight national, eight countries around Europe and plus the IOC. We also have China and Denmark and uh, Australia, the UK, Turkey, and um, 
sweet, uh, Australia as external partners. And we are taking very much this approach of heavily involving stakeholders, down, downscaling ocean acidification and other climate drivers down to local scales for a large range of um, uh, ecosystems and, e and coastal services, ecosystems, including ecosystem services. And you're very welcome and invited to participate um, in, this, in this team as an external expert if you contact me. Um, another way we can uh, work together is uh, the, the new or newish Imbu Future Earth Continental Margins Working Group, which I'm co leading with uh, Professor Sumo Liu. And this is also very much a stakeholder driven uh, uh, management focused science approach where we couple environmental and ecological change to services and discuss how management and we have working groups in Asia, East Asia, um, one based around the Sea to Coast project in Europe and you're welcome to propose other small working groups. Uh, there's obviously the OARS project which Steve um, will be presenting on, uh, which day is it, when I'm presenting this Thursday, so same day I think. Um, so there's lots of opportunity to collaborate, uh, a very short summary, global change does not equal local change. The Climate change scenarios from our system models are generally not useful alone for coastal and shelf studies. Um, OA research should be developed, undertaken and evaluated with stakeholders so that they understand the science that we are delivering, but they also guide the science that we are doing to make sure that it's relevant. And our work here, I believe, is a proven pathway to undertake sociological studies of OA relevant to SDG 14.3 at local levels for better management and safer utilization of coastal systems. Thank you very much.